Happy holidays. Today I want to talk about an age-old question, and that is how much do you need to retire? When you sell options, I believe you can retire on a lot less. Today I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to share with you what I'm doing in my retirement accounts, and then I'm also going to talk about the steps I'm taking in preparation for next year. So stay tuned. I think you're really going to enjoy what I have for you. Let's go ahead and jump right in. I do like to give a quick market update at the beginning of my videos. I don't really have much to add this week. The Christmas rally has continued. I think it's going to continue through the rest of this week and probably through next week too. I do think we may have some headwinds probably late January, maybe February. Definitely sometime during the first quarter where we may get a bit of a correction. Um, you know, what's my justification for that? Primarily the fact that, you know, the whole negotiation for the budget is going to occur again late January, early February. Uh, I do think the markets are really high currently. They're kind of due for a bit of a correction. I don't know if it's going to be a 10% correction or a 5%, but I do think at some point um, the prices are, are going to come down. There's been some good things that have happened that have kept the market up and continuing to go up higher or you know things along the lines of the dollars at one of the lowest points it's been in a long time interest rates have come down mortgage rates are in a much better level than they were a couple months ago um you know and then also gas prices gas prices have come down quite a bit and everyone sees that every time you go to the fill your car up, you see those lower prices. And every time you drive past the gas station, you see the lower prices. And that's something I think that influences people more so than even, you know, prices at grocery stores. But I've also noticed the grocery store prices have come down. So I think that's, you know, had a, a real good benefit related to this Christmas rally. And like I said, I think it will continue for the short term. But again, sometime in probably middle of first quarter where I do think we're going to get some kind of a bit of a correction. So just wanted to share that just, you know, once we get into these kind of situations, now the market's so high. At one point, most of my puts were in kind of in trouble back in October. And now a lot of the calls that I have are in the money, not, not a ton, but a couple, a couple that were, have not been in the money for a long time. So people get kind of complacent. They start thinking, well, these higher prices are normal and then before you know it, everything is turned around, you know, and that's kind of what happened to us in October. There was a lot of fear in October, early November. And, you know, now I think the opposite is occurring. So I just want people to be aware that things can change on a dime. And, you know, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if we do get a bit of a correction. And it's actually healthy for the market long term. So just wanted to share that now. One of the things that I did back in early October is I moved my 401k to an IRA within Fidelity. I did that primarily because I compared how that 401k did uh, earlier this year with another IRA that I had at Schwab and that where I was trading options and the IRA that I was trading options in was doing much better than my 401k. So since then, I've actually rolled a 401k and I'm actually selling options in this IRA account. Now, one reason I kept it at uh, Fidelity is it does pay really good interest on any cash that's sitting in that account. And this is any, any cash that's being used for, for the cash secured puts that I might have or the vertical put credit spreads. Um, and Schwab currently, at least not in the retirement accounts, it does not pay the higher rate if they will if you move it into a fund but then you've got to move it back out so that's the main reason why i decided to do it at fidelity and i've had a good experience i still prefer the schwab uh trading platform over the fidelity but fidelity is making improvements but so is schwab um, one other thing i did recently is i changed my accounts at schwab to work with thinkorswim versus street smart they it's either one or the other. You can't use both. And when I made that change, I actually could not, they didn't want you to have any open um, options or any open trades at that point in time, um, which I think was only 24 hours. So they must have made some changes behind the scenes, probably in the databases. 
So now I'm set up with Thinkorswim. I haven't started trading with that platform yet, but I plan to probably early next year. So in this new account that I've set up, my goal was 2400 a month, which is about 1.1% or close to 14% on a yearly basis just for, with selling options and the premium for options. Now, when you add the additional 5% plus, you know, any other kind of dividends, it's not unreasonable to think you can earn yearly on an average 20%. And that's what I've been able to do the first three months of, of having um, or trading within this, this account. So I'll share that at the very end. I'm actually going to share a spreadsheet where I talk about it. And I might actually show you what it looks like within Fidelity with my currently open positions within uh, that framework. But the fact that I can earn right around 20% is, is astonishing. Now you might say, well, that's not that good because NASDAQ's up 40% and S&P's up 25%. But I do want to remind you that it's all cash and it's all sell, selling cash secured puts or vertical put credit spreads um, using the wheel process. So I am taking a little bit more risk with using the wheel. Now, for those of you who are new to the wheel, it's just simply um, selling a put on the front end. And a put is where someone will pay you money to sell you stocks and um, picking up that premium and selling those puts with the hope of being assigned. So someone, you know, I'll end up owning those shares and then I can sell a covered call. And just like a put, almost like the reverse of a put, someone will pay me for the opportunity to buy my shares. And again, I'll sell it with a little bit more risk, a higher delta, like a 35 delta is what I've typically been doing. And then if it gets assigned away from me, I start the whole process again. Now, I can do this in a retirement account because I'm not being hit tax-wise. In a regular brokerage, you will have quite a bit of taxes and capital gains because of, of running the wheel. But it's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great way or a great strategy to do in a retirement account because, again, you're not going to get hit with lots and lots of taxes. Now, in the past... You know, a typical 401k or, or basic retirement account, you know, you'd be lucky to get six to eight to 10 percent long term. Um, so if you can double that and you can do 20 percent, then you really can take a lot more out. So if you're earning 20 percent, then instead of, you know, if you're using the four percent rule, you can really take out a bit more than you would have with just running the four percent rule. So, you know, the account I'm talking about here is two hundred thousand dollars, so I'm bringing in on a yearly basis close to forty. Well, I could potentially spend twenty of that and still be doing quite well. So the opportunity to bring in a lot more cash, or if I just wanted to sit for a couple of years, if you use something like the rule of seventy-two, which if you divide seventy-two by your interest rate, it tells you how long it would take to double that account. So if you use the rule of 72, so divide 72 by 20, it's like every three years or so, you'd be doubling that account. So, you know, one strategy a lot of people have is to take Social Security later and start, you know, um, or hold off from accessing those accounts and double that account. So say you have eight years, you could potentially double the account from 200 to 400, then 400 to 800 if you're able to do it in three, three to four years versus eight to 10 years in the traditional sense. So, and that's what I'm finding. That's what I've been able to do. I've also been able to do this in my other retirement accounts that are currently at Schwab. And I did want to mention, I am looking to move those at Fidelity or to Fidelity. So I'll have my retirement accounts at Fidelity and my taxable brokerage accounts at Schwab. And the main reason for doing that is I have not found a way to earn the higher interest on the cash that's you know being used by these cash secured puts within Schwab, I, you actually have to move it into a fund, then move it out. But once it's in the fund, you can't use it for cash secured puts. Um, I tried to do that, but they have made changes that I am able to do something along those lines within the brokerage. So it kind of works out well. So I'll have all my taxable accounts at Schwab, and then I'll have my retirement accounts at, at Fidelity. Now, if Schwab does find a way to change that, I might move things back, but this is my plan currently. I spent many hours on the phone with Schwab to no avail with the retirement accounts. Um, they did make changes, so 
who knows, maybe with at some point they will make enough changes and it will work in the retirement accounts. But that's what I'm doing now if anyone's interested in knowing that. Um, so one other thing I, I did want to mention. So when I run the wheel and I, I sell the put, it gets assigned. I sell the call, it gets assigned. One thing I am doing is if the outer put, um, and probably going forward the outer call, I, I currently don't have any calls in this account, I'm going to purchase that outer put or call if it's inexpensive. So what is inexpensive? Um, one of the ones I did recently, I was able to buy a $10 spread or the, the outer strike was, was only a dollar to purchase it. So if it's something that's that cheap, then I am definitely doing it as a vertical put credit spread. So my wheel is a little bit different. A lot of the a lot of the positions are vertical put credit spreads versus just cash secured puts. Um, I still have plenty of cash to cover the uh, vertical put credit spreads, but again, if I can buy that put fairly cheap or in the reverse, buy the call pretty cheap, then I will. Um, the reason I might also do it for calls is if you have a high growth company like Squares, you know, or how Apple's been over the many years, and it just shoots through the roof, well, you might have it assigned away from you, but by purchasing the call too, and it goes way up, then you have the opportunity to own it again. And it's only that that spread area that, that you don't own the shares and you don't, you know, your call isn't profitable yet. But again, that in an instance where a stock just goes through the roof, um, you know, to give you a for instance, Square has gone from, I think it got as low as 38. Now it's, I believe, approaching 80. Um, so if you had sold calls on that and bought the outer call and turned it into a call credit spread, you could then again own the call. And I think it, it works out a little bit better, um, you know, so that you don't necessarily miss on the upside potential. Something I'm looking at, I currently aren't doing those kinds of trades, but I'm definitely thinking about it. I'm also thinking about any really high growth companies that I'm pretty confident there are going to be high growth companies. I might also just buy a couple calls just for the ability to own them at a much higher price. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to share, and I'll have a link in the video, is... I typically don't do stop losses. I typically manage the trades and I do it right around 21 days. That's the whole reason for my weekly planning worksheet. I typically will put any positions that are expiring in the next, you know, three to four weeks on that spreadsheet and I'll start managing them at 21 days. And it's worked out really well for me. At, at times I felt like, well, maybe I could have done a better job if I had done stop losses. But I'm beginning to question that, and I did find a really good video from Tasty, Tasty Works. I think it's Tasty Works Live, and I'll have a video or a link to the video below that talks about how they found through their number crunching and statistics that actually managing the trade at 21 DT, DTE, you can do better than actually, you know, setting up a stop loss. So I wanted to share that. That's something else that... Um, I'm still playing with, but, you know, with doing my planning worksheet, it, it seems to work really well and has worked for me fairly well for several years now. Um, and then the other important point, and before we jump into the actual spreadsheet, and I'll share with you what Fidelity looks like and what my current positions look like, I did want to mention that this is a great time to do um, tax harvesting and and you can do it both for losses and gains. So I typically will look at my accounts at this time of year and see, you know, where do I stand? Do I have a ton of capital gains? And if I do, can I take some losses to lower those and vice versa? Or there's some stocks I need to kind of, you know, do I currently have a loss and I have, you know, some shares of an ETF or a stock that have gained majorly this year that maybe I should trim those? This is a really good time um, today and tomorrow to do that. And I actually have done that quite a bit. I've done some what I call loss harvesting. So I've sold some losers and have been able to lower my capital gains. Right now, I think I'm right at break even for both my Schwab um, taxable accounts. So it's something you should look at 
at doing and kind of rebalancing your accounts. Um, so that being said, let's actually jump into the next part of the video and I'll share with you and talk a little bit more about my retirement account and what kind of performance I've had. So stay tuned. Let's jump into the next part of the video. Now I've opened up a spreadsheet that I set up. This shows my performance for the fourth quarter with this account. Uh, but before I jump into details on that, I do want to mention I've about my memberships. I do have a basic membership um, and then a more involved membership, both at Patreon. The what I call my investors club membership is $10 a month and you get access to my trades. You can ask me questions. You get any additional content that's on Patreon. And then I have a more expensive membership that's $25 a month, but it also includes a weekly coaching call. So if you need a little bit more uh, handholding, it's a great avenue. Um, typically, they're supposed to be 15 minutes, but most of the time they go into 30 minutes. And I have a lot of people who schedule a weekly meeting and it's worked out really well. I really enjoy talking to people and I'm OK with it going, you know, going a bit over. So if you haven't looked at my memberships, I suggest taking a look. It may be well worth your while. And as always, please hit that like button. Please subscribe. I'm trying to get the word out. I want more people to realize that this is a great avenue for not just passive income, but also for the ability to retire a lot sooner than you ever thought possible. So with that being said, let's jump in. So this is just another spreadsheet I set up. Um, this is my new IRA, again, at, at Fidelity. And I originally moved the money on Monday, September 25th. And here you can see this is Thursday. Yesterday, these were the amounts. So I started with a, va a value of $217,827,000. Um, and again, this was an old 401k I'd had from Bell South, which later became AT&T. So it's now, it was an AT&T 401k back probably 20 years, years old. And it did fairly well. Um, but again, when I compared it to my IRA with options at Schwab, I did much better in that. So here's my weekly goal of 600. This is just starting out. I probably will increase these um, going into next year. But initially, when I did this back in September, early October, I set six, a 600 weekly goal and then a 2400 monthly. Again, just 600 times four, which comes to a 1.1% monthly and then here were the steps, the rolling of the 401k to the IRA, which was a real simple process with Fidelity. Fidelity did a great job and, you know, they have the ability to take control of your screen. I mean, they, they can't actually click on anything, but they can point and you can tell them, you know, what you want to do or not do. And it just made it really easy to set things up. Um, fun using puts. So, you know, so I've primarily been selling cash secured puts and vertical put credit spreads. Um, the income, this is that 5%. This is about what I've been earning on a monthly basis in that account. And then this is how I was looking at funding it. Now, am I sticking to this somewhat? I definitely have sold uh, some puts on SCHD, my favorite uh, dividend ETF. Then a good bit into SPY, IJH, IWM, IJR, VII. So some of these I have sold some puts on. I believe I have done, well, I definitely have done IJH, IWM, and IJR. SPY, I have not done one yet. If SPY comes down, I probably will. Also VII, which is, I think it's the Vanguard total market. Um, and in others, these will be specific stocks and securities that I also want to own. Um, <clears throat> so my performance, and this is where I stood as of yesterday. So 22,000, I did get assigned Corning, which is the only one that so far has been assigned to me. So it's currently, I have 200 shares and they're worth 6093 as of yesterday. So they're up like four or $500. I believe it was a 28. I think I sold a 28 uh, put on them and they were assigned and now it's over 30. Um, there were a couple of others I wish I had picked up at the same time. Um, but the, with the market shooting through the roof, you know, this was, Corning was the only company that was assigned to me. Um, 
so the total account value was is as of yesterday was 229.58 and that was an increase of 11,241 which is a 21% increase um which you know which works out quite well for that time period so that's on a quarterly basis you can see the equation here it's taking the total amount and then it's breaking it down on on a 90 day baseline so for for a yearly return it's it's right at 21 percent, so a little bit better plus i don't have i'm going to get one more cash payment i believe i'll get that today's the 28th i believe i'll get it on the 30th i believe that fidelity pays it the 30th of e 30th of each month which will be right around 850 i think the last one was 865 so it may be as much as 865 um, it also does not include another trade that I'm probably going to do tomorrow is what my guess is. I'll do one more trade within this Fidelity account. So this is probably going to be more like 23%, 22, 23. And also doesn't include any dividends that might come in from um, the 200 shares of Corning. I think it pays like 3.5% dividend. Um, so this would probably be a bit higher. I mean, if I add, let's just say I'll add another thousand. Yeah, twenty three percent. So it probably would be more like a twenty three percent yearly return, which again is what I talked about. It's if you can do this in you know year in year out, um, you can just see you know one you can increase the size of it, double it a lot quicker, and then. Like I talked about earlier, you can pull more funds out. Um, now, these were just other guidelines that I'm using, the wheel strategy with around um, a 30 delta for puts. It's more like a probably closer to a 35 delta for puts. And I, I'm going to do a higher delta also for ETFs. And I, just naturally, I'm, I think it's the right call to do a higher delta for ETFs. They don't move as much as stocks. Um, so for some of those ETFs I was talking about a minute ago, I would do probably even, you know, again, a 30, 35 Delta in, in this account. Now in my regular account, I would still probably do closer to a 20 or 25, um, you know, for, for accounts that aren't just full of cash that are, you know, fairly well invested. I, you definitely use a, a small, a smaller Delta. So for my regular brokerage accounts, I, I still stick to, closer to a 2025 delta for for calls and a f probably a 15 maybe a 20 delta for ETFs in my broker my taxable brokerages and for this account I've been really trying to stick to more like 90 days I, uh, DTEs I've probably been doing closer to 65 DTEs um, and that's worked out really well I think right now I have maybe 12 or 13 positions that are opening. And again, I managed it at 21 DTE. So again, that three weeks, I'd, I'd like to bring any positions that are expiring and from all my accounts, not just this account, but all my Schwab accounts at about three weeks out, maybe four weeks out, depending on if they're already in the money or I, I need to actively manage them. And again, I've been closing at around a 90% profit, profitability I probably should lower that a little bit, but it's it's worked out fairly well. Um, I I may lower that and try to close these more often. So, and I can show you what what this account looks like. So here, here's what my account currently looks like with Fidelity, and right now, you can see almost all of these are have positive values for gains. So I've got Best Buy, I've got CF Industries. I've got um, uh, COP, which is, um, one of the, what is it, the oil company, ConocoPhillips, I believe, Cisco, here's Corning, here's the shares that I own, so you can see they're already up by $511. I also have Google, um, which is, again, fairly far out of the money, still a little expensive to close, but that'll come down as we get closer and closer to expiration. I got IJH, this is Another small cap ETF that I like, IJR. Another ETF, small cap. Um, I think these are, um, I think this is 
mid value and this may be low value, but um, both very good ETFs that have worked out well. MetLife, this is one I probably can close pretty quickly here. It's very profitable. It looks like I could close it for eight to eight dollars or so, eight to ten dollars. So I may look at closing that before the end of the year. So today or tomorrow, Polaris. Now this one is probably the closest to the money, but it's still fairly profitable. But I brought in a lot of cash with it, and I like Polaris. Um, you know, I'm not. I've been warned by my friends that don't buy a motorcycle, Jim. You don't have balance. But something like a Polaris might be a lot of fun. And for people I've heard that, you know, don't have the balance for a motorcycle, something like a Polaris might be kind of fun. I think my son and I may go rent one and give it a try. And then Palantir, this is a new trade I'm doing. So um, it's done fairly well. It's it's still pretty close to, it. yeah, I, it's a 16.6. This is another instance where I could buy the the outer put for dirt cheap. Um, I think I paid a dollar for it too. And then Prudential, Square, again, Square's done fairly well. And again, it's pretty far outside the money. And I just did this one not too long ago. And then you got William Sonoma. Um, this one's going to expire in January. It's uh, I could probably close it too. And then Zoom, and I've liked Zoom, even though a lot of people don't like Zoom. Uh, at, at the sixth you know, $65, $70 range, it's fairly inexpensive. So, and currently everything else is just pure cash. So all I own is Corning in this account. And um, I am definitely going to take a little bit more risk. And in a way, I'm kind of looking for a little bit of a correction so I can um, take a little bit more risk and pick up some shares. So, so that's it. That's what I wanted to share with you guys as always. You know, being that we're coming to the end of the year, I encourage you to look at what you can close and what kind of tax harvesting you can do. So if you have any comments, you know, I typically will answer my comments fairly quickly. So please leave a comment. Um, and then as always, uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful, happy new year. Thanks for joining me.